Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. And we're in New York, and you might notice that we're in a different studio, but we're still in New York City. And joining us again to continue our discussion is Professor Alexander Buzgalin. Alexander Buzgalin is a professor of political economy and the director of the Center for Modern Marxist Studies at Moscow State University. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. I'm very glad to have this dialogue. So you are a professor of Marxist studies, and one of the core concepts of Marx, as I understand it, is socialism is born in the womb of capitalism, just as capitalism was born in the womb of feudalism and so on. And the, uh, the, the conditions for the development of socialism argued by Marx and Engels and others, Lenin and others, was that a fully developed modern industrial capitalism gives rise to big enterprises that are extremely well planned internally, even though overall in the economy and the politics, it's still anarchy, it's still very chaotic and there's no planning. Um, and that the, uh, if, if those big enterprises could become public, publicly owned, then all that internal efficiency and, and organization could then extend towards the whole economy and you could have a planned economy and avoid the periodic crises of, and recessions and so on. Um, wh when you look around the world now and you look at this thesis, uh, how does one apply that to what you see? You made great provocation, and I'm afraid that I will not uh, propose now borrowing lecture, but <laughs> provocation is for borrowing lecture, really, <laughs> especially for professor. <laughs> yeah. uh, if we can look on modern uh, development of the material production, we really have a material basis for the beginning of communist era, the beginning. I will use one historical parallel. For the beginning of capitalist era, capitalist mode of production, it was necessary to have uh, division of labor and automized producers. Industrial, industrial system was not inevitably necessary for the beginning. For the um, stabilization, for the victory, yes, it was necessary to have industrial production. So the period from relatively developed uh, craft production with division of labor, with roads, and uh, with relatively free or free personality, it was basis for market and for the beginning of uh, capitalist epoch. Okay, br then, br br hang on. Break that down for people who don't know what you're talking about. So, so uh, when you mean division of labor, what does that mean? Uh, division of labor means very simple thing. I'm producing bread, you're producing milk, another guy is producing butter, somebody producing uh, equipment, uh, somebody is helping for horses to grow up, and so on. Yeah, Everybody is doing his separate things. Instead of one Instead farmer of one doing everything, everything, everything for himself. Yeah, because uh, people were living uh, thousands of years when everybody was produced by family. All and consumed by family, yeah. So, uh, and capitalism was growing with zigzags, with uh, victories and defeats 500 years. Even now in Russia in 21st century, we still don't have final victory of capitalism, by the way, yeah. So, the same with genesis of communism. Meaning there's still some feudalism in the countryside. Yeah, we have a lot of such, 40% uh, of potato is produced in the dacha, uh, pieces of land which people has uh, to have food in poor regions of Russia. So, uh, and this is Russia, this is not starring Central Africa, yeah? So, uh, let's move to the parallel. Uh, for genesis of communism, it's also necessary to have minimum prerequisites and optimum basis. Minimum prerequisites is uh, strong developed industrial production with big enterprises specialized in different spheres and interconnected by international cooperation or at least national cooperation. We already have this in main countries of the world even in newly developed uh, new industrial countries like Brazil, Russia, China, and so on. So this is minimum. And we can start moving to the new society with assistance of plan, uh, with modern computers, with modern internet technologies. Even now, huge corporation knows what everybody, Buzgalian, you, another girl, boy, uh, I don't know, dog, bought in the supermarket this minute, this second, because this is uh, universal information. Through social networks, it's possible to receive information about every step of everybody in the world. 
And it's not problem technically, it's not problem to put all this information together and to use optimi optimization models. The problem is social. Plan an economy. Plan an economy. The problem is social. Just a, an example of one of the most brilliantly internally planned economies is Amazon, yeah. which does exactly what you're saying and, yeah. and, 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 and is able to not just know when you like a particular type of toothpaste to tell you here's a tube of toothpaste, but to plan that supply chain globally. Yeah, it's true. So, uh, and the problem is social. And main problem, uh, main negative feature of market is not simply crisis of all production or disproportions in some spheres. Main negative feature of market is uh, consumerization of society, commodity fetishism, and fetishism now even of uh, simulacra of commodities, signs, symbols. Uh, simulacra means, uh, okay, one example which I use everywhere, maybe it will be well known after that. If you have a jacket with Hugo Boss here, this jacket will cost $1,000. If it is, I don't know, Red Moscow, it will be $50. What is the difference? Brand. And uh, this value is created by marketing, not by production of goods, by production of symbols. And this production of symbols is main negative result of market. And people who are spending, I don't know, all weekends in the mega malls uh, for shopping, they are worse than alcoholics, uh, they are shopaholics. I don't know if it's possible to say in English or yeah, not. That's yeah, a, that is a term. Yeah. yeah, so that's why this is negative, and we can move this. But this is minimum prerequisite for movement towards new society. Why? Because the communism is society where people uh, have as main need Interesting work. Second, in your working place, in your life, you have not competitors who must be killed. Not uh, physically, but economically killed. You have uh, people with whom, in solidarity, you're making together something interesting. This vision, the way you're articulating it, more or less, was the same vision from Soviet Union from the 1920s and all the way. What, and it didn't work, it didn't become the kind of society you're talking about. What's different about now? Oh, first of all, in 1920s, uh, we had the absolute minimum material basis for the beginning. It's like to build capitalism without machines, even without steam. And to build capitalism when you have not simply steam, but electricity, diesel, and so on, it's much easier. Yeah? So now we have a big progress of productive forces, if I can use Marxist terminology. Second, we have uh, experience of 100 years of mistakes and victories, and this is also very important. And finally, even now, we have chances only to start this process. And then will be long zigzag. I use parallel of Mississippi, which is going from north to the south with a lot of zigzag. So we can start moving from the very beginning, not small, very, very small river. Communist huge river will be in the future and if we will pass through all the exacts and barriers. So this is the problem. And uh, modern capitalism, financial capital, virtual fictitious financial capital, creates enormous obstacles. Now, main efforts of uh, technicians, uh, software specialists, uh, artists even, is used for what? For marketing, for management, for financial speculations, for increasing of derivatives, the best, profit, profit, profit. Most of the most of the best mathematicians and even financial physicists yeah. are working on Wall Street writing algorithms to game the stock market. Yeah, and uh, what is technical progress? Uh, 19 zero, beginning of 20th century, first airplane can fly 200 meters with speed 50 kilometers per hour. Yeah. 50 years later, airplane 900 kilometers through continents. What we have now, the same airplanes. So you've got, if you call this the material conditions for socialism, you're saying communism, uh, is these enormously well-organized, efficient, massive corporations like Amazon's the, one of the best examples, but there's others. Uh, and artificial intelligence is going to raise that to a whole nother scale, but they're privately owned. And as long as that's, the, the ownership remains private, uh, there's no reason any of what you're saying should come about. It's absolutely true, and the choice is very simple. Either we have elite, uh, a lot of uh, semi-slaves, 
And a lot of useless, of course, useless people. People cannot be useless, but they are useless for capital. Or we have communist society, or socialism at the beginning of movement in this direction. Now why do you jump to the word communist? Because this ain't going to happen fast. There's going to be a long transition period. Uh, yes, of if course. it happens at all, it's going to okay, be a long. Uh, for me, it is important uh, in order to show the trend. Uh, I used the word communism because, um, you know, when you fix uh, socialism is transformation from capitalist or even feudal and capitalist society, slavery, feudalism and capitalism together to the new society. And period of transformation is socialism. Uh, but if you lose trajectory, if you lose direction, it will be tragedy. I am asked in China very often, uh, we have the same uh, economy as in uh, Soviet Union during new economic policy? Yes or no? I say, in some aspects, no. Why? Because uh, during new economic policy in 1920s, it was said, we must move from mixed economy semi-democratic political system with a lot of uh, oppression of people because it's class struggle in very intensive form, towards the real democracy, real humanism, real socialism. And this is the vector with zigzags, but in this direction. China doesn't have this direction. They will, can say the more private property, the better. Just very quick for people that don't know, what is that NEP period in the Soviet Union? New economic policy is period just after uh, socialist revolution and civil war, which started in 1921, led by Lenin, Bolsheviks, but uh, with a lot of uh, bourgeois intelligence together. And it was period when we had the market economy with plans. We had a lot of private property, especially in agricultural, in, the, in villages, in agriculture. Uh, we had the first state enterprises, uh, and we had a very big enthusiasm from below. Uh, millions of people in poor country, ordinary workers, participated in clubs where they were learning how to make poem, how to create poem, how to be sportsman, how to be scientist and engineer how to make radio, it was uh, more than to make computer now, uh, how to go to the space, uh, of course not uh, space, but uh, to make airplane, I don't know, plan or something like that. Uh, so the idea is that you could have a certain amount of privately owned development. Yeah, it was a big amount of market. As you head property. towards the bigger arc towards socialism, whereas in China they seem to be heading towards a bigger arc towards state capitalism and not much yeah, beyond and, that. Uh, uh, when it is official rhetoric, they will say that they're moving in socialist direction. But uh, to say that we will less and less private property, never. They don't touch this question. So I don't want to go to the problem of China, but uh, just to mention. Well, let's go back to the, the, the scale of uh, internally well organization, the globalization of production that came with digitization and computers that enabled all of this is about, you know, we're on the precipice of a whole new real qualitative leap in that kind of technology called artificial intelligence. Uh, what do you make of the significance of, of that? And, and the fact, one, in the, in the short term, meaning in the next five, ten years or so, we could see millions of jobs lost. Uh, and then two, the, uh, if you add to that the climate crisis and, and the deteriorating environment and the deteriorating ability of humans to live on this earth, um, I really see that the wealthy elites, and I, I'm, I'm told they're actually, that literally they are talking about having their own escape plans and imagining a life which is the wealthy serviced by robots. Artificial intelligence creates everything. And the rest of the population of the world can live like in the movie Hunger Games. You know, they can go screw off and, and whatever happens to them too bad. And there's a very serious conversation going on amongst the elites that the real danger is that if when that happens, the elites will be so dependent on robots and artificial intelligence that AI is actually going to take over from the humans. And the very serious scientists are projecting, in fact, that that will happen. And they're concerned about that part. They're not so concerned about what happens to the 80, 90 percent of the rest of the people of the world. Um, first of all, you gave the answer <laughs> in many aspects, and I agree with you. But uh, I will give comment on your comment. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, 
about uh, this artificial intelligence and uh, elite and so on. They will create uh, jobs for servants, for slaves, because even now you can go to the restaurant where there is no waitress. And it is more efficient, cheaper, and no problems. But uh, if you are rich, you want to sit and to have 10 persons around you, one will bring you bread, another will bring you butter, third will make something else, uh, one girl will come and put the, the, the napkin. So that's why for servants, for slaves, it will be space, but this is terrible. This is not salvation of the problem, this is creation of the terrible problem. Uh, second, uh, important remark, uh, to have jobs is not as important as it is in, in communism, as it is important in capitalism. Because uh, communist society means that you can work uh, four hours a day and it will be two times less jobs. And it will be very good, very positive, because people will have time to educate, to develop their cultural level, not to spend time in supermarkets and with drugs or computer games. The key problem of communism is not to create jobs. But that, that, not that, to create then you get the question, that, who's con going to control this artificial intelligence? Because the kind of world you're talking about, it ends up a political problem. Who has power and artificial intelligence for whom? That's the key question. And the key is, the, the answer is very well known. If uh, we have grassroots democracy, uh, basic democracy, so if life is uh, controlled by people, to make it simple, we can move in the direction of uh, society where we have short working day, where we have uh, a lot of tasks to work in the sphere of culture, education, art, uh, ecology. We have uh, a lot of social problems to put all these poor people who, who are starving and to move them to the cultural life, to create creators from degraded people. This is a task for everybody for 100 years. So we have a lot of work to, which must be done now if we have no necessity to produce things. If we have robots, then we have enormous amount of work to make everybody poet, to make everybody healthy, to make everybody educated. And among this everybody, billions of people who are in terrible situation and who cannot do it themselves, it's necessary to help them to do this together. I'm absolutely happy that we had these uh, long uh, dialogues and very important dialogues because Russia is very isolated from the world in many aspects. And when we can explain what is our life, how it is interconnected with international processes, when we can be together in these dialogues, it's extremely important for us. So I ask everybody who has interest, let's be in touch. And this is not uh, abstract word, uh, solidarity. This is real necessity to move to build international solidarity. And this is a task for intellectuals, for ordinary people, for left, for everybody. And thank you very much, Paul, for this talk. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for everybody who was watching us, listening to us. Well, thank you so much. It's a, it's a privilege to finally have you here and not just on webcam. And thank you for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network.